Greetings and welcome to this book launch event on my colleague David Hollenbach's newly released book, Humanity in Crisis, Ethical and Religious Responses to Refugees. I'm Michael Kessler, Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University and a faculty member in the Government Department, Theology and Religious Studies in the Law Center. Professor Hollenbach's book lays out the complex moral issues surrounding the global refugee crisis. He challenges us to bear the responsibility to develop practical solutions and work together across humanitarian agencies, faith communities, and governments to protect the dignity of the vulnerable and displaced. David Hollenbach is the Pedro Arupe Distinguished Professor in the Walsh School of Foreign Service, is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center and affiliated professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Georgetown. He's the author of The Humanity in Crisis, Ethical and Religious Response to Refugees, the subject of today's event. Before coming to Georgetown, he joined us from uh, Boston College, where he held the university chair in human rights and international justice. More details in, bio in the biographies are available on our uh, event website. Joining David will be three distinguished colleagues. Alexander Alinikoff is director of the Zollberg Institute on Migration and Mobility and a university professor at the New School for Social Research. From 2010 to 2015, he served as the UN Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva. Alinikoff was formerly a professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where he also served as Dean and Executive Vice President of Georgetown University. He was co-chair of the Immigration Task Force for Pre President Obama's transition team in 2008. Elizabeth Ferris is a research professor at Georgetown's Institute for the Study of International Migration and a resident, non, a non-resident senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. She joined ISIM in fall of 2015 after serving for nine years as a senior fellow and co-director of the Brookings Project on Internal Displacement and as an adjunct professor in Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Prior to joining ISIM and Brookings, Beth spent 20 years working in the field of international humanitarian response. Clemens Sedmek is professor of social ethics and interim director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies at the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. He also is a concurrent professor at Notre Dame's Center of Social Concerns. Before coming to Notre Dame, Sedmik was the F.D. Maurice Professor for Moral Theology and Social Theology at King's College London. On behalf of my colleagues at the Berkeley Center, we're delighted to thank the University of Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs Washington office for co-organizing this event. I would also like to extend our thanks to our co-sponsors, Georgetown's Human Rights Institute, the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, and the Institute for the Study of International Migration. Two other notes, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the event page on the Berkeley Center's website within the next few days. If you're registered for today's event, you'll receive an email when that video becomes available. In the last 15 to 20 minutes, uh, we'll take some time for uh, Q&A, answering questions from the audience. Um, please submit your question by opening the small Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen and typing in your question. Please include your affiliation uh, and I will be uh, curating those and um, posing them to the uh, participants. Now I'd like to turn it over to David who will give some remarks for uh, about 10 minutes and then Alex, Beth and Clemens will each offer some reflections. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, and I look forward to our interaction at the later in the session together. I thought it would be useful to start off by just highlighting a few reasons why my book has t the title Humanity in Crisis. There are two main reasons why I selected this title for the book. First, of course, the number of refugees and forcibly displaced people in the world today is at an all-time high. We have over 70 million people around the world who have been driven from their homes by a variety of causes, fleeing for their lives in many cases, 
fleeing uh, from persecution, fleeing from the effects of war, fleeing from uh, oppression and human rights violations, sometimes uh, across an international border, in which case they become a refugee, technically speaking, sometimes remaining displaced within their own country as internally displaced people. But humanity in crisis refers to the crisis faced by these people who have no home, who have been forced into a situation where they are facing uh, severe deprivation in refugee camps, in informal settlements, in some large urban affair, urban settings in poor, very poor countries. Uh, these people are facing genuine crisis. And the crisis that we sometimes think of as a refugee crisis, namely the crisis of large numbers of migrants coming to Europe or to the United States, is very minor in comparison to the crisis being faced by these millions upon millions of people who have been driven from their homes. A second meaning, though, for the term humanity in crisis that I think is very important is that we are facing a kind of shattering of the common humanity that should bind us together as a human community. The human family, which reaches across national borders, uh, is building walls to keep people out who are in desperate need and who are facing very severe challenges. And our humanity is, crack, is fractured and the crisis that I'm referring to in my book is that that fracturing of our common or shared humanity. It seems to me that that's also a very severe crisis that we face in our world. Now I'm gonna say a few words in a few minutes about the importance of national borders and I think they do remain important in our political and uh, moral world. Uh, but our, hum our common humanity is more fundamental than the national borders that separate us. And to see people's lives on the line and to turn away from them by attempting to exclude them, to deny them the right to asylum, uh, to, uh, to deny them the capacity uh, to, to flee from violence, or even worse, to send them back, to refool them, as the technical term goes, to send them back to a situation where they would be in grave danger, it seems to me is a violation of the common humanity uh, that should be binding us together. So that's point one that I'd like to make about what the title Humanity in Crisis is all about. Secondly, my book is about both the ethical and the religious response to the needs of these people who are facing this kind of crisis, the displaced, uh, the refugees, the internally displaced, and so forth. And I, from a religious point of view, it seems to me uh, that there are some very important reasons why one needs to, to, to respond positively to the needs of these people. Religious communities are among the most important respondents to the needs of displaced people in our world today. Just to give you an example from the United States, here in the United States, there are nine major agencies that are involved in finding ways to resettle refugees that are being admitted to the United States. Of those nine resettlement agencies that work in the United States, Six of them are faith-based. Six of them are based in religious communities, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. Uh, second point that highlights the fact that the refugee uh, response and the response to forced migrants has a religious component to it is if you go to any number of the places in the developing world where the vast majority of refugees are located, whether it's a refugee camp like the Kakuma refugee camp or the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, or if you go to an urban setting uh, like the situation in Nairobi, Kenya, in the vicinity called Kibera, which is a part of the city of Nairobi, where there are many refugees who are not in refugee camps but are 
living in informal settlements, very, very poor settlements in a place in, in the poorest section of Nairobi. Most of the refugees there that are being assisted are being assisted by faith-based communities. There are plenty of secular agencies operating as well, so I don't mean this in any exclusivist sense. But it's important to keep in mind that many of the respondents to the needs of refugees are faith-based groups. For example, if you look at the United States, some of the two, two big agencies that operate uh, to the assistance of refugees from the United States, um, the Catholic Relief Service and World Vision, they're both among the very largest refugee assisting agencies in the world. World Vision is an evangelical Protestant organization. Catholic Relief Service is obviously Roman Catholic. You've also got HIAS, the Hebrew Immigration Assistance Society. You've got Islamic Relief. These are agencies that are responding to the needs of refugees in an important way. There are big secular organizations like Oxfam, the International Rescue Committee, uh, but the faith-based groups are, they have, for example, budgets that are approximately the same as the largest of the, of the secular agencies. So we need to keep, and what I try to do in my book is examine one of the reasons, some of the reasons why faith-based agencies are so involved in this. It seems to me that one of the reasons why religion is a significant factor in the response to the needs of refugees is that it provides hope for people who are in situations that could easily lead to despair. Both the displaced people themselves who find nourishment and support from the faith communities that assist them that find support from their own faith, whether it's as Christians or Jews or Muslims. And the same is true of these agencies that I've mentioned, the faith-based agencies, the, work, the people who are working for them and working to assist those who are displaced are keep their hope alive through, in some cases, their own faith. Now, of course, there are very important secular reasons for doing this as well. The fundamental commitment to fundamental human rights, the recognition of the basic human dignity of every human person, all of that is um, reaches across religious and non-religious boundaries. Uh, but there are strong religious foundations for the response to the needs of refugees. I like to highlight the fact that the three great monotheistic traditions of the West, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, the founding of each of those major religious traditions has roots in migration and in displacement. Uh, Judaism begins with the Exodus, the flight of uh, the Jewish people from persecution uh, in Egypt into the Promised Land. The Jewish community is also a group, as a community that has a deep history of exile. Uh, the exile of Jews into, the, into uh, Babylon is a, and this makes it, so if you want to take two of the major themes of the Jewish faith and the Jewish history, exile and exodus are among the, fa f among the formative uh, events in the life of Jews that have given a very powerful meaning to the Jewish identity. The same is true in Christianity. Very shortly after the birth of Jesus, Jesus with his mother Mary and father Joseph had to flee to Egypt uh, from Bethlehem. And they were fleeing from persecution uh, by Herod, uh, the ruler on behalf of Rome in, the, in Israel at that time. And they fled across an international border between Israel, uh, Palestine, and Egypt and therefore, if you go back to 2,000 years ago, in the right after the birth of Jesus, you could see him as one who was technically, according to the current definition in international law, he, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were refugees. And this gives Christianity a strong sensibility about the need to respond to refugees. You will find this in many aspects of the New Testament especially the call upon Christians to recognize that their future 
um, salvation basically depends upon their response to the poor uh, and to the displaced among them. Uh, they fit when you feed the hungry, when you respond to those who are homeless, respond to the displaced, you are in fact responding to Christ is one of the images that Matthew, St. Math, um, Matthew's gospel brings to the fore. And Islam, Islam begins the, z the year zero in Islam, on the Islamic calendar is counted from the year when Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina, fleeing persecution as a refugee from Mecca to Medina. And so the year zero in Islam is counted from what's now called by Muslims the Hijra, the migration of, uh, of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. So these, con these religious traditions have very deep commitments to refugees because of this. Now their ability to follow through on this has obviously been very imperfect. Religious communities have indeed become sources of displacement because of interreligious rivalry, but I try to highlight in my book the resources that can also rate, lead to an interreligious collaboration for the service of refugees and for the response to those who are displaced. And the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees committed, convened an interfaith discussion of this issue a number of years ago in which the religious communities of the world recommitted themselves to the service of refugees. That's the religious component, my second point. The third point I'd like to make about what the book is trying to do is to try to highlight some of the ethical reasons for our need to respond to the, to the refugees that we see uh, in our world today, 70 million displaced and uh, including refugees and internally displaced. The ethical foundation is that common humanity that I spoke about earlier. Our common humanity is the basis of a universal commitment to human rights. If you go to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it repeatedly says all people have a right to life. All people have a right to uh, a homeland. All people have a right to adequate nutrition. All people have a right to health care. All people have a right to seek asylum if necessary. The common humanity that we have is the basis of a universal understanding of human rights, and that that universal understanding of human rights is at the ethical foundation of our obligation toward those who have no home, those who have been displaced from their home. Now, borders remain important, as I said. But I would also want to highlight that, a, that national borders do not override co our common humanity uh, when our common humanity is in crisis or threatened. I like to think that we have duties that reach across borders when several, several norms come into play. When there's severe need, when someone is in great need, when we have the capability of assisting that person, and when we can assist someone without disproportionate burden and burden to ourselves. Need, capability, and assistance without disproportionate burden. I think when those three conditions are met, we have duties that reach across borders. Now, if you look at the world today, you'll see that most of the displaced people in the world are living in developing countries in countries that are much less, have many fewer resources than the United States. About 85% plus of the displaced people in the world are in developing countries. And 33% of all the displaced people in the world today, or of the refugees in the world today, are living in the very poorest countries of our world. These people are in great need. I'm thinking of people like the million refugees from South Sudan who have been displaced to Uganda, or the nearly million uh, Rohingya refugees, uh, Muslims, who have been displaced from Myanmar, Burma, into Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a very poor country, and it's hosting nearly a million Rohingya refugees uh, from Myanmar. Uh, 
These people are in great need. And if we look at the United States, the resources that we have to come to the assistance of the countries that are hosting those refugees is quite extraordinarily large compared to the resources of a country like Uganda or a country uh, like Bangladesh. And therefore, as I said, if there's extreme need, if we have the capability of responding, and if we can do so without disproportionate harm or burden on ourselves, it seems to me that we have a real response to responsibility to provide resources. That means we have a responsibility to grant asylum to some people who are fleeing, but it also means, and in, this is a very strong point in the most in the recently developed uh, global compact on refugees, we have a, a strong responsibility to come to the assistance of the poor countries and developing countries of the world that are already hosting most of the world's refugees. I like to remind my, uh, people of a statement that was made when Angela Merkel, the chancellor in Germany, uh, admitted about a million Syrian refugees to Germany back in 2015, 2016. And she was trying, uh, Chancellor Merkel was trying to get the rest of the European Union to come to their aid. And David Cameron, who was then the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, said, well, the United Kingdom will do its job, it take on its moral responsibility. We will admit 20,000 Syrian refugees to the United Kingdom over the next five years. Well, the Interior Minister of Lebanon, country which is now hosting about one out of every four people inside the border of Lebanon, is either a Syrian or Palestinian refugee. Well, Interior Minister of Lebanon said, well, we're very grateful to Prime Minister Cameron for his generous offer, but we would like to remind him that Lebanon has admitted that number of Syrian refugees over the last two weekends not the next five years. And so the disproportionate burdens that are being placed on countries in the world uh, by the displacement of refugees is another area where humanity is in crisis, where we are not carrying the burden that we have the capacity to care to carry. So let me conclude with that, uh, to say that the carrying of these burdens, um, we have the capacity and the capability of doing a lot more than we are. There are a lot of need for changing of the international structures to make it possible to do that. But let me stop there and invite our other participants to, to get into the discussion. I've talked enough. So thanks a lot. Well, thank you, David. Just a reminder for those who have just joined us, um, the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen, if you'd like to pose a question for anyone um, on the panel, um, please click that button and you could submit it and we'll be uh, gathering those questions and posing them later in the session. Um, Alex. Thanks, Michael. And uh, David, congratulations on the publication of this wonderful book. It's, um, it's very rich. It's got a, uh, many long discussions of both the religious uh, doctrine, connotations, implications, but also a deep dive into uh, some of the political science literature and humanitarian literature and the like, and it comes together really in a very uh, powerful way. Uh, you mentioned in your comments just now a, uh, a conference uh, that was held at UNHCR in 2012, led by then High Commissioner Antonio Guterres. I was at UNHCR at the time, and I remember this conference convened of leaders of religious based, uh, religiously based humanitarian agencies. The topic was faith uh, and protection. I think there were more than 400 representatives there. It was quite a full room of people. And, and it occurred to me at the time that seeing the people, the dedication of the people in the room, that a lot of secular humanitarian, secular NGOs get things wrong when they, they sort of insist that humanitarian relief, that has, has to be apolitical, but that it also has to be secular. There shouldn't be mosques built, for example, in refugee camps. There should be kind of a, a US-based separation of church and, and state. Uh, and it struck me that it really came home to me that that was wrong. And, and for, for three of the reasons that you point to uh, in your book, David, you list a number of uh, ways in which faith assists in humanitarian assistance and situations. Let me just 
uh, called to attention three of them, which I saw um, really made very clear in this meeting at UNHCR. Uh, first was that religious belief can help sustain those who are suffering the effect of crisis. Those are your words. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, the second is that faith communities provide communal support to people who are often feeling quite isolated and obviously removed from their, their homes and, and, and uh, in a disjointed kind of life, separated from family and, and their home communities and faith communities can help to restore that. And then thirdly, religious belief, um, informs and it, it energizes the work of people who help uh, the displaced. Um, when I was at Georgetown, it was commonly said among, uh, among the Jesuits there, we, we help others not because they are Catholic, but because we are Catholic. And, and that certainly comes home for many of these religious organizations who are often working with, with groups that were not uh, co-religionists. They were of other, other groups. Um, and what, what, a, what really, came home to me uh, at this meeting was the importance of using the humanitarian system to reach out to people in all aspects of their lives. It's not just enough to, uh, to give them medical attention or clothing or, or food, but that if we are trying to restore a life, um, we need to, again, as Jesu would say, we need to meet them where they are, physically and spiritually, and that means care for the whole uh, person. I must say at this meeting, I remember leaning over to the High Commissioner and saying, as we were looking out at this big group of people, this is your army. You don't have an army, but this is your army. These are people committed to helping marginalized, dispossessed populations. And in the words of the Sustainable Development Goals, those furthest behind. Uh, and as, as you just noted, David, NGOs are in fact, religious NGOs in fact, are among the most important of UNHCR's uh, partners. I'm, I'm going to make three very quick points. Uh, I hope I'll do them just in a, a sentence or two um, each uh, in the remaining time here. Uh, the first is that the, bold, the book adopts a very bold uh, definition of the scope of humanitarianism. Again, it's not just feeding the hungry and healing the sick, but it's meeting basic needs, protecting key freedoms, sustaining key relationships for all people. These are David's words. Full participation of the marginalized in, in planning and relief efforts a call for reform of institutions and structures that produce suffering uh, and flight of people, so dramatic call for institutional reform, and then recognition of the polycentric world that we live in where lots of different kinds of groups can, uh, can, can play a role, transnational actors, religious organizations, regional associations, civil society. And look, I, I'll leave to others the debate over religious doctrine, how far religious doctrine can be pressed in service of these, these, uh, these terrific uh, goals for a broadened scope of humanitarianism. Um, I can say that I, I hope people of faith find them persuasive and as much as I hope that moral, uh, secular moral claims for making the world over uh, are also persuasive um, uh, to actors as well. So the first point is really how, how bold a vision you have here of humanitarian action. The second, which you just ended your comments with, is the importance of global responsibility sharing. I'm quoting a sentence here from the book, uh, um, where you say how to achieve greater fairness in sharing the responsibility toward those affected by emergencies today is perhaps, perhaps the greatest ethical challenge facing the humanitarian movement today. And I fully agree with that. And I would say not just those affected by emergencies, but also after the emergencies pass, those li living in what are called by UNHCR and by the community as uh, protracted refugee situations. Where we know that about 80, 80 to 90 percent of people are living in the global south in protracted situations. And those cannot be ended. People cannot have their lives rebuilt and restored unless there is much greater uh, responsibility sharing uh, among the, uh, the other countries of the world. Um, and it's this central problem, really, what I think of as stuckness, the fact that people flee, gets put into a humanitarian relief operation, and then never get out, never go home, never move on, never get integrated into a, another society. That is the central problem facing the current refugee regime. And that can't be solved without responsibility sharing how 
we actually produce that I could perhaps talk about in the Q&A session and I put it to David. Uh, we, we say this, but how do we actually uh, make it happen? Um, my last point goes to another, I'll pick another uh, sentence from the book where uh, you say the most common cause of emergencies today is armed conflict and more generalized violence. And I think that may be true today for the many emergencies, but, but I would say that uh, that's changing. Um, and in fact, in the most recent report of the internal displacement monitor, monitoring center uh, for the last year, I think it shows that there were three times as many people displaced by environmental causes, largely climatic events, than by conflict. And I think this is going to be the real challenge coming forward for the humanitarian system, is not just the situations of conflict, but situations of uh, displacement and humanitarian emergencies due to environmental causes. And I would think, David, this would fit, uh, as you discuss these kinds of issues, uh, it would fit with your ethical and religious uh, premises here to say, in the environmental context, there's a particular obligation and responsibility imposed on the global north, which is largely responsible for the environmental changes that are affecting people in the global uh, south. And that kind of harm. We lawyers would talk about these in terms of uh, sort of notions of tort and responsibility, uh, but I'm sure religious traditions uh, talk about these in other ways that those who are responsible for harms have a responsibility, a duty, an ethical or religious uh, mandate to uh, try to uh, rectify those wrongs. Thanks again for the book. I really enjoyed reading it. I learned a lot. Thanks. I'm delighted to be here to comment on the book that David has written. I think we need much more attention to faith-based organizations, faith-based responses to refugees and humanitarian issues generally. Because at heart, the question of refugees isn't just a question of politics or economics, but, but is deeply a moral or ethical question, which David raises very well in his book. Um, I found it a very thought-provoking book, and I have three issues I'd like to raise, and maybe David would like to respond. The first is the relationship between faith-based responses to refugees and basic humanitarian principles. Central to the humanitarian endeavor since the middle of the 1800s has been the idea that humanitarian work should be neutral, shouldn't take sides in conflict. And certainly we've seen the Red Cross and other organizations have used this acceptance of their neutrality as a way of working with victims of conflict on, on both sides of a particular conflict or war. You know, but when you get into faith-based responses that look at justice, causes of displacement, you know, there, there are some tensions there with this concept of neutrality. You know, certainly Catholic social teaching and that most of the world's religions talk about working on the side of the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden. Um, and when you start looking at questions of causes, what causes people to flee Syria, for example, or South Sudan, to address those kinds of issues usually means taking a side. And we see this in the secular world with human rights, watch, uh, human rights work, where you're often on the side of those struggling for justice, whether racial justice in the US or past discrimination in South Asia. It's very hard to be neutral, to not take sides. So my question you know, for David is, how do you reconcile this moral imperative to address the causes and struggle for justice with humanitarian principles of, of neutrality? Do humanitarian principles need changing or do we need to find ways to, to live with this tension? A second set of questions has to do with the relationship between legal obligations and moral obligations particularly with respect to refugees. As you point out in your book, our 1951 Refugee Convention was, was developed in a different time to meet a different sort of, of needs. It was designed to help individuals who were singled out for persecution on one of five reasons find protection. While most of the world's refugees and displaced you know, flee generalized violence, not to speak of disasters, and environmental issues as well, but a much broader range. You know, and so governments which have signed the convention have legal obligations not to send people back to countries where their lives are in danger. I might add this is a legal obligation the US is violating right now by refusing to accept asylum seekers on our southern border. 
But nonetheless, those legal obligations have really formed the bedrock of the international refugee regime. Now, you introduced the idea, and certainly others have as well, the idea of broader moral obligations not just to those who meet the specific definition of the Refugee Convention, but those who are fleeing because they're afraid for lots of other reasons. You know, how do you bring together this moral obligation to groups far larger than those included in the Refugee Convention? Is it time to develop new conventions? Or do we need new legal instruments or new moral understandings of what our ethical obligations are to those living in different situations who, for various reasons, need protection and assistance. And that whole relationship between moral obligation to a big group while maintaining the importance of legal obligation to a more limited group, you know, how do we, how do we work with this? Particularly, as Alex mentioned, you know, the, the projections are that in the future we may see tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people leaving because of the effects of climate change. Currently, there's no legal convention, there's no general consensus on how this group of people should be dealt with when they seek to cross another border. The third question that occurred to me was one that, a term I really hadn't thought about before that you use in your book, and that's proximity. You talk about, you know, we have a greater obligation to those who are suffering near to us as well as the other criteria you spell out. But then you bring in the notion of moral proximity. It isn't just my neighbor next door or the border of my country, but we can think about moral proximity of knowing about people in need in distant places, whether it's Syrian refugees fleeing or Bangladesh, situation in Bangladesh right now. You know, so how do you, when you think about moral proximity as bringing about an obligation, doesn't that lead to you spending more attention on the high profile media covered emergencies? For example, a lot of people in the United States know something about Syrian refugees, at least that there are a lot of them and that they face desperate needs. But do we have a greater obligation towards Syrian refugees we read about in the newspaper than say the Cameroonian refugees who are fleeing horrific situations that we may not know anything about. And related to this is um, you know, the whole issue of internal displacement. You know, like internally displaced people, those who flee often for exactly the same reasons as refugees, but there's no UN convention on IDP. There's no UN agency charged with caring for them. Oftentimes their assistance and protection needs are far greater than refugees. You know, what are our moral obligations and do we want to talk about legal obligations at some point toward those who are fleeing and haven't been able to cross an international border? And finally, really, as a way of transition to Clemens, I wonder if we need to rethink our understandings of protection in light of COVID-19. And we've seen protection as a way of keeping people safe, not sending them back to countries where they're lives are in danger. We've seen protection in terms of protecting women from gender-based violence. Do we need to think about protecting people from deadly diseases such as COVID-19? Is sending PPE and ventilators to Somalia a protection action, a way of protecting people, keeping them safe? But listen, I enjoyed reading the book. I thought it raised lots of questions and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks. Clemens. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Beth and Alex, for your comments. And thank you, David, first of all, uh, for the book. Congratulations to the book. I learned a lot. It's a thought-provoking book, and the title is now timelier than ever, isn't it? After COVID-19, humanity in crisis is uh, very much to the point. I want to offer three reflections on building institutions, um, honesty about accompaniment and crisis ethics. Building institutions, honesty about accompaniment and crisis ethics. Um, I know, David, from your works that you um, consider institutions very important drivers of social justice. So institutions are the subject of social justice. And in the book, you make the point that the current global institutions, 
that have been built after the Second World War reflect the system that is potentially out of order. And then the question is, well, what's the alternative? What can we do with that? And um, I was in Austria in 2015. So that's where I can spot the, the accent. I was in Austria in 2015 when the migration challenge hit Europe. And uh, it was clear that the European Union is not prepared to deal with this challenge. And maybe not so much politically prepared, but morally prepared uh, not to deal with this challenge. And it has a lot to do with what you describe as the commitment issue. So the compact on refugees is a wonderful tool. And you comment on this compact, the global compact success will be heavily dependent on the voluntary commitments of governments and voluntary commitments that sounds quite fragile. And then at the same time, we know that we need strong institutions as drivers of um, the kind of change that we want to see. Compassion, as you also say, is not enough. There is this interesting line in the book, compassion may overlook the institutional dimension. Compassion may overlook the institutional dimension. Now, I'm not disputing that. I'm just asking myself, can we build compassionate institutions? And how can we build compassionate institutions? We have this uh, challenge in poverty research that many well-to-do experts administer poverty and they don't have this kind of experience. And I was trained by the Jesuits uh, back in Innsbruck, Austria. And, and I remember in a lecture being introduced to Pedro Arupes, famous letter on poverty written to the, provinci uh, the provincial of the uh, province of India on January 8, 1973 where the superior general, Father, uh, Father Rupe said, well, poverty has to be felt. We don't expect Jesuits, I mean, to, to live in favelas and teach at the university at the same time, but we expect them to feel poverty. And my question is, would it be a way to build compassion institutions if you have a second person perspective and not just a third person perspective? And I found it powerful that at the beginning of the book, you talk about your own experience with Jesuit refugee service in Eastern Africa, and your own experience, where I think this makes quite a, um, a difference. I remember Gerald Cohen's so-called interpersonal test, where he says, are you willing to say to the poor what you say about the poor? And that's a shift in the perspective. So that's my, my first question. How can we build compassion institutions? And would this experiential approach that Pedro Rupe called for uh, be helpful for that enterprise? My second point is honesty about accompaniment. Jesuit Refugee Service uh, is explicit about its commitment to accompaniment as a very important way of being with a person rather than working for a person. And you mention in the book uh, humility and commitment as two important ingredients of, of accompaniment. And um, I'm, I'm all for that. I, I just wonder uh, how honest can we be in public when talking about uh, the high cost of accompaniment? I'm involved in the Humanitarian Corridor Project in Italy, where Italy has brought uh, in the first installment uh, 500 refugees from Somalia, South Sudan, and Eritrea to Italy on a legal and safe pathway. And they have been dispersed all over Italy, to different dioceses and small units, accompany small units of refugees. And it's really an accompaniment model. And it is a beautiful model. And I think naively, this is the only way it can work. But these refugees are quite often traumatized, have mental health challenges, and it comes with a high cost to accompany uh, these human beings. I mean, these are, these are human beings. These are not angels. These are not objects. These are human beings with the whole spectrum of what we see in, in human beings. And it, it reminds me, if I may draw this comparison, of um, the famous movie Sideways. Um, and I don't remember too much of this famous movie Sideways. All I know about Californian uh, wine tasting, I know from this movie. Um, but they made this point about Pinot Noir as opposed to Merlot. There was a lot of Merlot bashing going on in this movie. But uh, the way Pinot Noir was described is, it takes a lot of care and attention, a special soil, a lot of time and patience, but the result will be a wonderful wine, Pinot Noir. And that's how I think about refugees. It takes a lot of time, a lot of attention, special soil, but then the result will be amazing and they will be contributive agents to the different contexts, but there is a high price to, to be paid for that. And uh, in terms of just the, the involvement, the cost, the time investment. And 
that brings me to this question of uh, also connected to institutions. Is that an issue of what's sometimes called the moral division of labor? The moral division of labor between institutions, communities, and individuals. And I think that's um, what you uh, aim at when you talk about polycentric responsibility. You have so many centers for responsibility, and, and it, it's not just big players and global institutions, however important they may be. It's not only individuals like you and me, it's also intermediate players. And, and maybe there's a way to think about um, a new paradigm of thinking about migration refugees uh, looking into habits. How would our everyday habits have to change to be more accommodating to this challenge? Nancy Rosenblum wrote this book on good neighbors, where she makes this point, if you want to have good democracies, you need, you need to have a culture of good neighborhood and, and being a good neighbor. Um, Ellen Scarry wrote this book in 2011, Thinking in an Emergency, where she talks about the role of habits. So it's, it, it, it's important that everybody knows CPR, and this is part of how we can change our health system. So that, that's my second point, being honest about accompaniment, the, the opportunities for polycentric responsibility, moral division of labor, and maybe also these new chances of private-public partnerships or private sponsorship models that would be, you know, I, I think there's a lot of potential in that. And my last point is uh, crisis ethics. So humanity in crisis is, uh, as I said before, uh, timelier than ever as a title and, and as a thought. And what we observe in Europe in 2015, and what I think I can observe now in the COVID-19 crisis is a movement inwards. So new nationalism and, and this sense of individuals trying to uh, protect uh, their own livelihoods over and against others. Uh, maybe you know Irene Nemirovsky's uh, novel, uh, Sweet Francaise, where she talks about the uh, Nazi occupation of France. And she said at the beginning, people were full of solidarity and openness and accompanied in each other. But the longer it endured, I mean, the more selfishness emerged and the more desolidarization movement could be observed. So that, that's a concern. How do we endure solidarity in a crisis? Michael Walser and, and Tom Sorel are two philosophers who thought a lot about crisis ethics and how to avoid this, this moral black hole where you have just utter chaos. And, and uh, I think that's where your thoughts about the common good are really, really interesting. Uh, but also uh, the question, do we have to rethink the common good in times of the crisis? Because if you read Aquinas and what uh, he has to say about the uh, common good, it has a lot to do with the stable order. But what about the common good in a situation of crisis and an emergency where fundamental values are being challenged? And, and that brings me to my conclusion. Um, in an emergency, in a crisis situation, it's not just about prudent judgments. I mean, you're a Jesuit. It's always about prudent judgments. Don't get me wrong. It's always about prudent judgments. But it's, it's not the only way of making moral decisions. I remember more uh, um, Rowan Williams once talking about two ways of making moral judgments. One is the prudent way, you have alternatives and then you argue back and forth and decide what's the best alternative to go forward. That's one way. The other way is I have fundamental commitments that I cannot change. Here I stand, I basically, that's what I have to do. And what we saw in the financial crisis in 2008, when all the money of the world was available to save financial institutions. What we see now in many countries in a COVID-19 situation where all the money of the world is available just to make sure that we don't collapse. It seems to be this kind of moral decision making where we say, this is where we stand. It's not about alternatives, we have to save that. And my hope is that people can read your book as, well, these are human beings, they have dignity, they are suffering. And this is not about looking at the options, this is about making this fundamental commitment to uh, whatever the cost is, as Angela Merkel and you, you quoted her, we are schaffen das, we have the capability to do so. Thank you so much. David, a few minutes to respond and then we'll open it to Q&A. And I'd like to remind everyone to go to the bottom if you have a question to pose. Uh, find the Q&A button at the bottom and you'll be able to uh, enter a written uh, question which um, I'll sort through and pose uh, those that we have time for. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all three of the respondents. Really rich uh, uh, observations and I learned very much from them. I, there's no way I can respond uh, 
to each of the points in any depth, let me just say a couple of things that I think can touch on response. To start off with, with Alex and, Eliz and Beth Ferris, both raised the question of uh, the environmental challenges that we are facing in, uh, as a cause of displacement today. And I, I am fully aware of that, and it's likely that that's going to be, in the future, the number one cause of the vast majority of displaced people that we're facing. It seems to me that um, this raises the important question about how we define the, those who need protection. Uh, the refugee definition is explicitly about fleeing persecution and across an international border. I'm not entirely sure that uh, we want to open up a big debate about revising the actual definition of refugees from a legal point of view, because given the state of the world today, I and others, a number of others have been worried that if we, if we put the definition of refugee back onto the, onto the legal discussion board, uh, it might get more restrictive rather than more inclusive, given the nature of the way attitudes are operating in the world today. But what I would surely want to do is to say that agencies, humanitarian agencies, faith communities, those with strong commitments toward responding to the people in the need in the world, we have to respond not only uh, to those who are displaced by conflict or not only to those who are fleeing persecution, but also to anyone fleeing a serious threat to their very fundamental human dignity. And that's where the environmental displacement comes into play. That's where COVID-19 comes into play, any number of reasons. Now, what do we do about, the, how do we do about, respond to that institutionally? Uh, that gets into some of the issues that Clemens is raising. It seems to me that the, we have to look at the domain, well, let me put it this way. I like to think of the common good, the shared good, that's my good and your good, it's our good, that that's the dynamic that should be shaping the institutions that organize our lives together. Because the institutions touch not only my life or not only your life, they touch our life. We have to find ways to shape those institutions in a way that takes the good we share together into, into account. And that would mean we have to find the kind of response to not only uh, alleviate the problem of those who are uh, displaced by environmental causes, as uh, many people in Bangladesh are every year ago, they have to move back and forth from one part of Bangladesh to another. We need finding ways to, to, to create institutions that can bring a, a shared good to the life of those people. And when they are becoming refugees and displaced across other borders, the border it reaches beyond the borders of Bangladesh into India and other places. And so it becomes then an international question. And that's where we have to look at how do we create the appropriate international institutions to protect people from that kind of displacement or to protect people against the effects of COVID-19. COVID-19 is obviously an example where the common good is at stake. Um, you, if we can get rid of COVID-19 in the United States, but it remains strong and remains in, in place in places like Nigeria or Central America, it's going to be back in the United States. There's no way that this disease can be confined to one country. And the refugee displacement situation is like that. It, it reaches across borders. The environmental questions are like that. They reach across borders. So the question then becomes, how do we create the kind of institutions globally that can help us respond to the needs of people who are sick because of uh, the coronavirus, People are fleeing environmental displacement. And that means looking at the kind of creation of institutions that we sought to create after the Second World War. The European community was devastated by World War II. 
there was danger of another war coming to the fore if, if the Soviet Union decided to invade Germany. The next thing, anyway, there were a whole, France couldn't get along without Germany. After World War II, the French still had a steel industry they wanted to revive, but they needed German coal to make the steel plants run. So they had to create the beginning of the, what became the European coal and steel community, which was the origin of what became the European Union. And we're facing crises like that right now about addressing refugees, addressing environmental questions, addressing the, addressing the transnational transmission of disease. And so I guess that's the big issue that really faces us. It's not a small project. We're looking at a very major initiative about rethinking of some of the structures of international order today. And that's a real challenge that we have to address uh, in the future. And we're talking about what Alex in his most recent book calls uh, the rev revision of the regimes that govern how we deal with refugees, how we deal with environment, how we deal with the transmission of disease. These regimes need major, major, major revision. Um, there's lots more to be said. I could go into the discussion about the relation of humanitarian neutrality to the commitment to justice. Uh, but uh, and I, I would want to say that I think that justice has to be really fundamental, even more fundamental than neutrality. And that's, we saw that uh, with the beginning of Médecins Sans Frontières, breaking off from the International Committee of the Red Cross back uh, many decades ago. And, but I would be on the side there of saying that justice is more fundamental than neutrality. Uh, and that's another point that Beth raised. So let me end it up there and open it up to Q&A from the larger audience, though. Okay, so the first question um, is from Elise Anderson, a recent uh, Magus uh, grad uh, from SFS. And she says she's a former student of, uh, of yours, David. Um, right. As we are all aware, the pandemic is exacerbating the already existing humanitarian issues worldwide. With lockdowns in place and countries and governments turning inward to combat the virus, how can faith communities come together to continue to practice service and give aid to those who need it most? Well, I mean, faith communities are transnational communities to begin with. Christianity reaches across borders, Judaism reaches across borders, Islam reaches across borders. So, their faith communities have a strong awareness of the international and transnational threat of a, a situation like COVID-19. Uh, and it's true of that's another reason why faith communities are so involved in the response to refugees, because they're transnational communities and they know what it means to think across borders and to respond with compassion and with justice across borders. Well, it seems to me that as we look at COVID-19, in relationship to um, people in refugee camps who are extremely vulnerable to COVID-19. Uh, I just saw a very distressing report in the New York Times, I think it was even this morning, that they're the first signs of the coming of COVID-19 to the refugee camps in Bangladesh, Bangladesh uh, where, um, where the, the large majority of the Rohingya refugees are located today. If, if COVID-19 hits a million refugees in the, the camps in Bangladesh, in Cox's Bazaar, it's going to kill a lot of people real fast. And so responding to that uh, and finding ways to prevent that from happening, it seems to me, is an urgent, urgent agenda. And the United States and Europe have to be worried not only about COVID-19 in their own countries, but COVID-19 in Bangladesh refugee camps where there are Rohingya, which could get into, could move into India very rapidly. It, it's, so the common good that we share together means we have to avoid the common bad of the disruption of COVID-19 uh, coming to refugee camps, which means it would spread rapidly elsewhere. So that's where the direction I would go in thinking about that. Any others want to jump in? Okay, so the next question is 
from Sarah at uh, Catholic Relief Services. Uh, thanks for this interesting discussion. Faith-based groups are an essential backbone of forced displacement and humanitarian response. However, studies indicate that interest in and affiliation with organized religion is steadily decreasing in the US, particularly in the younger millennial and Gen Z generations. How can these organizations continue to gain the support and funding they need given changing domestic dynamics? Should these organizations try to pivot in order to invite more domestic support funding or remain true to these principles and find other ways to continue their own efforts? And what would that look like? Well, I, this is a very good question, and it's a question that bothers me a lot. I mean, the decline of young people's engagement with religion, I understand where that's coming from. Many of them are worried about religious in affiliation with uh, conservative resistance to gay rights and uh, a number of other issues in relationship to religious communities so, so seeming to be identified with politically conservative agendas. But I think if you take the kind of serious examination of the depths of these religious traditions that I've tried to outline in my book, uh, it's, a, it's a distortion of Christianity, a distortion of Judaism, and it's a distortion of these faiths to see them as aligned with that kind of conservative political agenda. And therefore, I would say, uh, I'd like to see finding ways to get the younger people of our world to realize that these religious communities and these religious traditions have a radical dimension to them that challenge the status quo in a very important way. And if more young people were able to see that component of what religious faith is all about, um, they'd be a lot more attracted to it and be drawn to it, I think, in a way that would energize more people to be. So I would say faith-based community, uh, faith-based faith uh, groups like Catholic Relief Service, the more true they are to their commitments to serving those in need this way, the more likely they are to attract young people to see that this is what, that this is what Christianity or Judaism or Islam is really all about. May I add a comment, Michael, please? Yes, of course. Any of you I jump in anytime. I couldn't agree more. Uh, when, when Pope Francis was elected, he made this point about we don't want to have an inward looking church. It has to serve. And, and uh, I'm reminded of Caritas Europe and this question of is Caritas a, a diocesan organization or is it like an NGO? And it depends on the diocese, but sometimes Caritas tries to market itself as well. We are on our own and we are kind of disaffiliated from the broader church where the reputation is not so great. And if we get the message across that the very point of Christianity is, let's say, Matthew 25, it's about serving not building a huge institution that is mainly concerned with its own reputation, uh, CRS and these faith-based agencies would be really wonderful examples of this is what the gospel is about and help the idea of um, the church even in uh, her institutional form. If, if I could just jump in as well, I lived in Sweden for a couple of years which is a very secular society. I think less than 5% of people go to church. And yet the, the religious organizations were highly respected. People wanted tax money to go to Church of Sweden, for example, for its overseas work because they felt like it would do a better job than the government or even secular organizations. So there's not always a clear relationship between personal religious belief and support for religious organizations. Great. Okay, so the next question is from Lan Chu, an associate professor at Occidental College. Um, how do you see the moral and ethical policy and approach of these faith-based organizations translate into state action? Such organizations can present a symbolic moral or ethical challenge, but what would compel states to play a greater role in responsibility sharing? Well, I mean, that's where, um... I would, I would highlight the three values that the Jesuit Refugee Service is committed to as a way of highlighting this. They are committed to accompaniment, of being close to those being served so that they really relate to them as 
fellow human beings and not simply as recipients of bureaucratic service. Secondly, they're committed to service of actually delivering what's really needed uh, to those. And thirdly, advocacy. Uh, that finding ways to have the voice of displaced people and the voice of those most in need being brought into the domain of public policy formation, that some of these faith-based organizations are not only serving refugees and displaced people in the camps or in the urban areas where they're located, but they're also strong voices of advocacy that are testifying before Congress or bringing policy analyses to the fore. I mean, the Jesuit Refugee Service issued an, a, a document just yesterday, which is a strong analysis, very carefully articulated analysis of the failure of the United States to grant asylum to people coming from Central America at the southern border of the United States. And it's showing that what the United States is doing at that border is illegal. It's not only immoral, but it's illegal. And therefore, there is a way in which to try to make this case both to the US Congress, but also to the citizens of the United States to try to move us in a direction that would say, we have to move in another direction regarding the kind of policies that we're following at the southern border of the United States regarding asylum seekers. That's the kind of advocacy that I think we need that it's not only faith-based communities that can do that. There are all kinds of other groups, secular uh, human rights organizations, and uh, there's a human rights uh, uh, collaboration. I think it's with the International Rescue Committee that just put out a study of asylum as well, uh, blending humanitarian and, and human rights concerns on asylum issues. So it's not only faith-based communities, it's some of these others, but finding ways to really have these groups collaborate together can make a real difference. I highlight a point in my book uh, about how in the days when Southern Sudan and Northern, and what was then the North of Sudan, what before the country divided, when that civil war was underway, there was a very major initiative by faith-based and secular human rights organizations allied with the Black Congress in the U.S. Congress, the Black Caucus in the U.S. Congress, allied with uh, a number of other agencies, really made a difference regarding U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Sudan. And it helped move toward what became ultimately the independence of South Sudan. Now, South Sudan has fallen into another problem since then, uh, but if these agencies can really work together, they can, have a, they can have an impact on public policy and that that can make an institutional difference along the lines that we've been talking about. Michael, if I could just uh, underscore yes, that, that point just in my, uh, the times that I've worked both at UNHCR and also in the US federal government, we would meet regularly with advocacy groups. And I don't ever remember distinguishing a religiously based organization from a secular NGO. Um, people made points, they argued for the right way to protect and help people and, and they were taken seriously for the views they put forward and also because of the constituencies they represented. And so I, I would underscore David's point about the really important role of advocacy that uh, these organizations can play and do play. Great, this question is from Dominique Hinman. Um, are there organizations or individuals bringing refugees themselves into the conversation of how they are integrated? Um, there's a number of dimensions of this, of this really interesting question. Um, hope is needed to inspire individuals and communities through these traumatic events. Um, in a spiritual and psychological sense, individuals need to feel valued. Feeling of value also strengthens commitment to the community. Are the talents and skills of refugees, such as intellectual, labor, et cetera, um, how can those be brought in to be part of the solution? Well, I'll just say very briefly on that, that the, the commitment to accompaniment 
with refugees rather than simply coming in and telling them what to do. Accompaniment means listening, uh, first of all. That's, I mean, from my little, from my experience with some Jesuit refugee service uh, providers, uh, it's been said that maybe the biggest service that an NGO staff person can, can bring to a refugee is to listen to the person. Partly because these people who have been displaced from their homes, it's not too far away from despair that many of them are located. They, they're, they're on the brink of, of despair in many cases, but being listened to and taken seriously as a human being is a beginning of a restoration of some kind of hope. And that beginning of that restoration of hope is also a way of encouraging them to see that their participation in shaping what's gonna happen in the refugee setting is also a possibility. And may, looking about how they can participate in shaping the direction of response by public policy on these issues could be very important. So listening and getting input from refugees is absolutely essential. Uh, I think all the humanitarian organizations recognize now that that you can't you you have to take the ad, take the ad, the agency the activity of the people being served really really seriously and let them be part of the planning of what's going to happen and not simply trying to sort of deliver something to them in a passive in a way that reduces them to further passivity. That's a very important agenda item for all humanitarian agencies. Others may have some comments on that too. Just a brief comment, if I may. Uh, my, my colleague, Ilaria uh, Schneider von Wartensee, uh, is a scholar on refugees and, and she works uh, on a website, humanlines.org, and she creates a platform so that stories of refugees can be told and voices of refugees can be heard. And that's a, a very simple way of just, uh, you know, making people aware of there are huge numbers, but there are faces behind the numbers and stories. And these are extremely talented and resilient people. And they have a lot to teach us. So it's also, I think, about creating platforms and making sure that what's sometimes called epistemic injustice uh, is not entering the academic discourse, meaning uh, you don't do justice to people's insights into their own situations if you only talk about them, but don't uh, allow them to speak on their own behalf. That's how I see a new uh, trend in working with migrants, um, seeing them primarily as agents and not as victims uh, caught in unfortunate circumstances. But with agency comes the price. And the price is, it's, I'm a father of three children, and they were cute at some point, and then, then there's the point where they seem to be cute, and then their agency you know, increases. And uh, they don't do maybe sometimes what their parents would like them to do. So there's always this price that comes with agency. Uh, and when we talk about contributive justice, it means that they should be encouraged and expected to contribute. And by doing that, change our social structure. And then some people find this quite worrisome. So I, I really like this idea of, of um, accepting the risk of agency and building platforms to listen to voices and telling stories. Yes, great. Um, so the next question is from Tom Hampson of the Immigration Commission of the Episcopal, oh, Beth, do you want it to jump in? Oh, okay. Um, of the Episcopal Diocese of uh, uh, San uh, Joaquin, um, Modesto, California. Um, I wonder about the role of faith-based institutions in educating their constituents and the community more broadly in building political will to support the policies and institutional changes you discuss that would adequately address the needs of refugees and displaced persons? Well, I, I think that's a very good question and it's a question that needs to be dealt with very carefully by the faith-based church, by the churches and the other agencies uh, in the United States. Uh, I think that one thing that's been pretty clear within the Catholic community, which is my own community, is that Pope Francis has probably been the single most vigorous voice on behalf of refugees of almost anybody in the world in recent years. His position on refugees has been uh, 
highly visible and has had a very significant uh, uh, impact in raising the concerns of refugees. I don't think that's been adequately responded to um, in the United States, though, by the leadership of the church in this country. The church in this country and agencies like Catholic Relief Service, like the Bishop's Migration and Refugee uh, Offices, have been doing a fantastic job of delivering the goods on the ground for those who were displaced. But the U.S. bishops have not been adequate in bringing the concerns of refugees to the people in the pew. Uh, it hasn't been happening enough. It's been displaced by the sex abuse crisis. There have been a number of other issues that have been harmful to the communication of these values across the board to Christians and in Catholics in particular uh, in this country. And that we have to get beyond that. That means, of course, healing some of these other wounds uh, that are harming the structures of the Christian community and the Catholic community in the United States today if we're going to get uh, the voice uh, of the refugee and the displaced person heard in the pew more vigorously than it has been in recent years. Um, so I think that the service delivery by faith-based agencies has been great. I don't think that the communication to the people in the pew uh, in the Catholic community has been adequate, though, in recent years. I might add, though, this is an area where churches and other religious communities have a definite value added and a particular role to play, because there is a constituency there, whether it's study groups or task forces or films. It's also, at least in the United States, one of the few places we have where people from different political backgrounds can come together, where you can have people who really support President Trump and people who vociferously oppose him can come together to, to worship God and, and to talk about things like refugees. And certainly we've seen from you know, the whole gamut of, um, of types of political views of churches have been involved with refugee resettlement and some very conservative evangelical as well as progressive congregations have done wonderful jobs in terms of welcoming refugees. So I think that the more we can use that public education function that religious communities have, the stronger, stronger we'll be. Great. So the final question is from Shepard Mutsvara of the Pedagogical University of Krakow in Poland. Um, he asks, Poland has adopted an anti-Muslim narrative and as such would rather accept Christian refugees. What is the role of Christian organizations in advocating for the rights of others? Um, and he uses the other um, in the Levinasian form. Oh, I mean, I think that um, the anti-Muslim uh, narrative that you describe as having been adopted in Poland seems to me to be very regrettable. Uh, the Second Vatican Council uh, has been very vigorous in talking about the need for interreligious uh, communication and collaboration uh, by the Roman Catholic community, which has obviously been a very strong community in Poland. Uh, Pope Francis has been extraordinarily vigorous, not only in his advocacy on behalf of displaced people, but he's also been very vigorous in his pursuit of dialogue between Christian, Catholic Christians and Muslims. He conducted an extraordinary event just a couple of, about a year ago, uh, conducting a, a kind of a joint service of prayer and dialogue, issuing a common document supporting our common brotherhood between Christians and Muslims. It was jointly prepared by himself and the grand, the, uh, the Imam of Al-Azhar University in Cairo, which is in a certain sense, the leading voice in, in Sunni Islam. They issued a document on our common brotherhood uh, calling for collaboration between Muslims and Christians uh, in response to some of the issues. So if the Polish community, uh, you mentioned you're from Krakow there, 
that if the Polish community is to be faithful to some of its deep Catholic roots, it ought to be faithful to some of these initiatives from the Second Vatican Council and from the leadership of Pope Francis. Um, now that's a challenging uh, task, of course, because it's not, there are all sorts of other reasons operative for people are taking a different approach. But from a normative Christian and Catholic point of view, um, going to those norms from the Second Vatican Council and from the teachings of the Pope seem to me to point in the direction of saying that an anti-Muslim narrative is not the appropriate narrative for a, church, for a country or for anyone who considers themselves faithful to the Christian tradition. Great. Thank you, David. So um, I, I said that was the final question, but actually we just got a question in from uh, uh, Sarah, a high school student in Illinois, who, who says, hello, thank you to all for the informative presentation. I was wondering what people stuck at home can do to help with this refugee crisis. Are there any specific organizations that promote advocacy and help raise awareness for this issue? It seems like a fitting way to um, provide some closing thoughts and, and uh, wrap up with a uh, hopeful message. Well, there are, there are many organizations that are working on this. Uh, I mean, you, you, I mentioned a couple of mem groups in the Catholic community, the Catholic Relief Service, the Bishop's Migration and Refugee Service, the Jesuit Refugee Service. Um, these are very active groups. There are secular organizations that are doing a lot on this, Refugees International. Uh, you can look into any number of other secular groups. Uh, there are Protestant evangelical groups, like there are a number, of, there's the Jewish community has Hayas, uh, Islamic Relief there. And then of course, you've got, um, you can deal with directly with the United States government. Uh, raising questions about the protection of refugees uh, with your local representative in the Congress or with the, your local with your state senator. Uh, this would be a very important way to get at this or dealing with it in your local in your local town or city. Um, there is a question of often of, of whether or not cities and towns are open to the welcoming of refugees and what kind of support is being provided locally for refugees resettlement and so forth. So, but advocacy on behalf of greater openness to refugee resettlement with the US Congress and the US government right now is a major challenge because our present government and especially President Trump have been basically saying no to refugees and no to asylum seekers uh, and COVID-19 is being used as a further example of reasons for excluding people. But I think we can't solve the refugee, we can't solve the, the COVID-19 problem simply by turning our back on refugees. Because if, 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 if the COVID-19 hits, hits the refugee population, it's not going to be, they, it's not going to stay out of the United States for long. So we find ways to collaborate on this. But I'd say Turn to your local church, turn to your local faith community, turn to your local politicians, and advocate on behalf of those who are in great need. And, and that can make a difference. It can make a real difference. All right. Well, I'd like to thank David and all of the other panelists for this really wonderful discussion. And David, uh, once again, on behalf of the Berkeley Center and the Q School and uh, Georgetown and all of your uh, readers, congratulations on the publication of the book, and we'll look forward to hearing uh, more ideas from you uh, in the future. Let, thank me you thank every, let me thank everyone who's been a participant in this discussion this afternoon, not only the panelists, but also those in the audience who tuned in from various parts of the world. I'm very grateful for your interest and for your input, so thanks a lot.